All right. Well, welcome to this October 2017 meeting for the Google Educators Group of Ohio. Uh, this is a monthly meeting where we take a look at everything new in G Suite for education uh, from the last month. We share Google tips and tricks and answer questions related to using Google tools in school. Uh, howdy. My name is Eric Kurtz and I'm a tech integration specialist here at the Stark Portage Area Computer Consortium or SPARC for short. We're an information tech Technology Center uh, serving schools in Northeast Ohio. However, this meeting is open to anyone uh, in Ohio or outside of Ohio uh, or wherever you might be. And uh, we are happy for you to join us. Uh, all of the resources for today's meeting can be found in our Google Doc. Um, it's an editable agenda, which can be located on our GEG Ohio website. Uh, the link for the website is bit.ly slash GEG Ohio. Uh, once you get to that website, you can just click the link at the top for the monthly meetings. And if you scroll down just a little bit there, you'll see uh, each of our meetings. And there is a link to that live editable agenda document, as well as a link to the live video stream. The document uh, is, the agenda is editable, so hey, please feel free to add your own comments, questions, resources, links, and such. Uh, the agenda has several sections in there, including things such as uh, upcoming events, what's new in G Suite for Education, uh, questions and answers, and show and tell. Please feel free to add your comments to any of these uh, sections. We appreciate your feedback. Uh, in addition to the shared agenda doc, uh, you can also leave comments in the live YouTube chat for the meeting. I'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Uh, in the future, rather than just watching this live video, if you'd like to be in the Hangout and share a resource or take part of the discussions, we'd love to have you. Uh, just send me an email ahead of time and I'll be glad to send you an invite to join the Hangout. We'd love to have guests on in the Hangout to share resources and ideas and examples of what you're doing with Google Tools in your school. With all that said, let's go ahead and jump into the agenda and let's get this meeting started. All right. So as we start heading down through the agenda here, uh, we've done the welcome and intro there. Uh, going to pause for just a moment on the important links to remind folks that um, I do encourage you to sign in uh, with our um, uh, sign-in form here at tiny.cc slash gug dash sign in. Um, that link will take you out to a Google form where you can uh, sign in for the meeting today. And what I do then afterwards is I generate a certificate of attendance and uh, email that out to you. So if your school allows you to turn in um, uh, certificates of attendance from things like this, from online meetings for uh, professional development hours, hey, that's a great way to get those hours. Um, I also use that to report numbers to Google. I uh, don't um, send them people's you know names or email addresses or things like that uh, but we do send numbers to them to let them know how many people are attending each of our meetings so again if you follow that link and fill out that form it'll be greatly appreciated thank you so much for doing so Next up in our agenda, we've got our uh, updates as far as our current member counts. Uh, part of the Google Educator Group of Ohio is we do have what is called a Google Plus community site. Um, and if you head on out to that site, uh, that is like a big online forum where you can, again, ask questions and share resources and connect with others. At the moment, we have 2,633 educators as, a, as part of that community. And we would welcome you to join and participate and uh, learn from others. Next up, we have our section on upcoming events. These are uh, things that probably are a little bit more Ohio specific. So if you're joining us from outside of the Ohio area, um, some of these may not apply as much, although uh, the virtual things like the webinars certainly uh, will. Um, but these are some things that are uh, coming up in the next uh, few months that you may want to plug into. Um, at Spark, we do periodically run Google certification boot camps. Uh, just finished level one uh, yesterday, in fact, uh, but we do have a level two coming up in November. There's still just a couple spots left if anybody would like to join us for that, November 8th and 9th. Details are at the link provided, and we'll have uh, many more uh, certification boot camps in the future, so you can always keep an eye out for those. Got a couple of webinars coming up in the next few months. Uh, here in November, coming up in November, going to be doing a webinar on Android apps for Chromebooks. 
The idea is to look at uh, the two sides of that. The first is from the administrator side. How do you how do you do that? How do you turn that on and push those Android apps to, out to your Chromebooks? And the second half is from more of the classroom side. So so what can students do with Android apps on Chromebooks? What are some of the best apps for them to start experimenting with and using to be uh, creative in the classroom? That's November 14th. Uh, then in December, we're going to be doing one on supercharging Google Docs with drawings. That one's all about um, trying to leverage the fact that in, draw in Google Docs, if you go up to insert, you can insert a drawing in your document. And there's a lot of really nifty things you can do when you start doing that. It really opens up the the options for what can be done in a Google document. And so if you ever thought, oh, Google Docs can't do X, Y, Z, well, well, maybe it can with the help of Google Drawings. And so we're looking at some really neat ways for you and your students to supercharge Docs with drawings. All right. Beyond those webinars, we have a few conferences right around the corner here. Um, Tomorrow, in fact, if you're listening live, you can still get there. Uh, the Neo Thai Conference up at Beachwood High School. I will be there and looking forward to uh, hanging out with lots of great f folks, uh, including some people that uh, are uh, probably uh, watching this uh, this meeting right now. So I uh, just. I'll do a preemptive howdy and uh, see you guys there tomorrow. Uh, definitely encourage people to take advantage of that conference. Um, not too long after that, next week, we've got the Learn 21 conference down in Columbus. I'll also be at that. Looking forward to uh, meeting up with folks down there as well. Then uh, a couple weeks after that, in Cleveland, the Idea Stream conference is always an excellent conference to learn new ideas to use in your classroom. Um, there is a uh, summit in Cincinnati. So again, for those in Ohio, a lot of these are more Ohio specific, coming up in late November. Um, a, a Google Summit, and then um, a little bit further away, of course, but February, we cannot forget OETC, the Ohio Education Technology Conference. Uh, that is our big one for the year, uh, and uh, just wanted to keep that on people's radar to uh, be getting signed up and, and registered for that conference. All right, very good. If you know of any other uh, upcoming events that I did not know about. Again, this is an editable document. Please go ahead and just type on in here. Uh, at the end of the meeting, I'll swing back around and take a look and see if, if anything else has been added to the agenda. And I'll try to draw attention to that. But if you've got a conference coming up in your section of Ohio um, that I didn't know about, hey, please put it on there. If you've got a webinar coming up or some other professional development opportunities, uh, absolutely, uh, please add anything else to this document as need be. Awesome. Let's keep on heading down the list then. All right. Next portion of our uh, meeting is uh, one of the two big portions of the meeting. We, we usually spend a pretty good chunk of time taking a look at the what's new in G Suite for Education. And then after that, we spend uh, the other big chunk of time uh, answering any questions and sharing show and tell. So show and tell is uh, neat resources you've come across or um, neat ideas on how to use Google tools in schools. Um, and we've got a big list of those here today. We obviously will not cover every one, but um, we will hit the highlights of, of some that I definitely wanted to draw attention to. But again, I would encourage you to fill in anything in those sections uh, as need be. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump into what's new in G Suite uh, for the last month. So Google rolls out a lot of new things every month. Uh, and it is, uh, um, it's a, it's quite a, a task just to keep up on all of the new things that come out. And uh, so I do my best to try to monitor the blogs and uh, you know the different uh, sources that Google shares information on. And if something catches my eye that I think might be appropriate for schools, I throw it in this document all throughout the month. And so here are the things that popped up over uh, the last month since we had our last meeting. Um, so the first thing is that Hangouts Meet is going to be getting dial-in numbers. Now this one, I'm not totally sure if it's going to apply to schools or not. It has not shown up yet for me, so I'm a little 
curious if maybe they're just going to restrict this to businesses. Uh, but what's what it's all about is that when you fire up a Google Hangout, there's going to be the option to have a call in number. So if somebody is unable to get to a computer or a phone that can run the um, Hangout app, or they just prefer not to, um, there'll be a phone number that they can dial and they'll be able to jump in, at least on audio, to be able to speak in the Hangout. So it's another way to make it easier for people to connect through the uh, Hangouts tool. Again, keep an eye on that one. Not sure if that'll be just business. It has not shown up yet for me on my education domain. All right, uh, next up is one that I just think is really cool, and that is anything to do with AI. Anytime Google's talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, you may say, Eric, this doesn't like directly impact my classroom, but I think it's something you want to keep an eye on because this, these, are the, these are the big changes coming down the line that are going to have some significant impacts upon how we teach and how our students learn. Um, so uh, Google released a teachable machine experiment that lets you train an AI. So let me show you how this works. This is pretty slick. So if you head out uh, to the blog post, it'll talk about it. And then if you scroll down a little bit, there's a link to the actual uh, resource itself. So I'm going to go ahead and head over to the resource. And basically what it is, is you can teach an artificial intelligence live to do certain things based upon your input. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and skip the tutorial and uh, jump into it and show it to you real quick. So it should want to use my uh, microphone and camera. I will allow it. Hey, there I am. Howdy, everybody. Um, and so basically what's going to happen here is I'm going to be able to click on these buttons over here on the side where it says train green, train purple, and train orange. And I can do something in this case with my webcam to be able to try to um, give the AI a, a cue, like holding up my hand or, you know, putting up two hands or something like that. And I'll train it that anytime it sees one of these motions of mine, that it should show a GIF or play a sound or, or speak. So we're going to start with the GIFs and the green would be to make this kitten show up. The purple is to train the little doggy and the orange is to train the bunny to show up. So we'll start with the green. Let's say I'm just going to hold up my hand here. And when and so anytime my hand is up, I'm going to hold down the train green button. Anytime my hand is up, I'm telling Google, if you see my hand up, that means I want you to do the green button option. So I'm going to hold my hand here. I'm going to click on train green. And now what it's doing is it's taking pictures. And it's probably a good idea for me to move my hand around a little bit, you know, so that it's, you know, not just in one place the whole time. That way it gives it a little bit of variety. So it's got something to sort of compare it to. Now they want you to get at least 30 examples. And once you've got 30, you can, you can stop there. And anytime it sees my hand up, it should show the kitten. So let's try another one. Let's say I put my arm, you know, straight across down to the bottom here. And I hold that down for training purple. So now while I'm holding down the training, it's saying anytime Eric's hand is below his head and it's sort of at a you know horizontal sort of a, uh, an arrangement, that means that I'm trying to do the purple. And then we'll do one more. Let's just say um, maybe I put my, uh, my hand up at the top of my head, put my fist up here. And I'll say that's for training orange. So anytime that it sees my fist up uh, above my head, um, that is going to indicate that I'm trying to press the orange button. Now, when I'm all done and I've got enough of these trained in there, I should be able to just with my hand motions, bring up all of these different things. So let's try it out. So if I put my hand horizontally, there's the purple, there's the dog. If I do my hand to the side, there's the cat. <laughs> if I do my fist above my head, there's the bunny. Good job. And so I have trained the artificial intelligence uh, to bring up these. So it's really, really basic, but what a neat idea to show the idea of how we can start training artificial intelligence. And it's exciting to see what we'll be able to come from that as we start applying that more and more in the future. Uh, so anyway, just wanted to give you a quick heads up on that as a, a neat experiment where Google is showing a little bit more about artificial intelligence. Awesome stuff. All right, let's keep on going. 
Next thing up on the list is um, Google has officially uh, rolled out all the info on their new high-end Chromebook, the Pixel Book. Not going to spend much time on it other than let you know it is out and available for purchase, and the Pixel Book is a thousand dollars. Yes, so it is a very expensive Chromebook, but it's uh, again a very high-end Chromebook. It's not designed to be a just everybody's going to buy one of these things. That is not what Google's thinking. It's more of let's show folks what you could do with a Chromebook. Let's sort of set a standard out there, like a high-end standard of what you could develop and inspire other um, developers, other companies to start, you know, improving what they do with a Chromebook. Now, there's a lot of wonderful Chromebooks out there from 150 bucks all the way up to this thousand dollar Chromebook. And I've already heard that because of the launch of this, this new Pixel Book, um, that uh, Samsung and Acer are already looking at some ways to uh, do a little tweaking to their current top of the end models to push them more toward this. So um, again, it's just gonna uh, give us more options to um, have available out there for Chromebooks and putting out an awesome uh, tool like this, again, will help inspire folks to uh, improve the Chromebooks that are out there. Uh, I'll put it on my Christmas list, but pretty sure probably not gonna have a Pixel Book. <laughs> All right, next up, uh, uh, Google also announced two new versions of their Google Home product. So if you guys are not familiar with Google Home, it's the one here in the middle of the picture. It looks kind of like a uh, air freshener. <laughs> uh, I have one of these. I got one for Christmas last year. I love it. It's really awesome. And you can just, you know, speak to it and it'll, you know, do things for you. It'll answer questions. It'll play music. It'll play, you know, videos on your TV in your house. You know, you can just talk to it and get information, ask it what your schedule is for the day, all sorts of great stuff. Well, as awesome as it is, um, the price was a, a little bit prohibitive for just anybody to pick one up and just say, hey, well, that's a, that, that's a no question buy. I'm just going to grab that. Um, now they've released two new versions. And the one that I really want to draw your attention to is the Home Mini, the, the little guy here. It's got all the same, you know, uh, abilities as the larger one here, but it's only $49. So we're definitely getting into that price range where you could say, hey, I'm going to get one of those for my classroom or I'm going to have one of those, you know, at home. And what it's going to do then is basically give you the ability to just speak to Google anytime you need and get spoken feedback um, in, in response. Now, to go along with that, if you jump down a little bit further in the agenda, um, there's another article near the bottom of what's new where... Here it is, uh, on 1024, uh, where Google Assistant gets lots of new kid-friendly commands, activities, and games. Well, Google Assistant is the tool that's running inside of Google Home. That's the, you know, the machine learning artificial intelligence that's running inside of it, as well on many modern Android phones. Um, and so what we found here was that Google Assistant has been updated with some new kid-friendly commands, activities, and games. So there is a blog post that will tell you a little bit about that. There's games like uh, Play Space Trivia, or Help Me With My Homework, or Mickey Mouse's Adventure, or Sports Illustrated Kids Trivia, or Tell Me a Story. And then the other link actually takes you out to the product page where they go into a little bit more detail about those. So if you had one of these products, if you had a uh, Google Home Mini, um, you would be able to uh, access all of these different things, musical chairs, um, uh, here's uh, uh, which DC superhero are you most like, and if we keep clicking through here, we can we can play freeze dance, uh, what's your planet, what's your inner animal, what fruit are you, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, lots and lots of ways to interact with it. So thought that might be an interesting thing to see how that might work in a classroom to have the uh, much you know more affordably priced uh, Google Home Mini uh, to have that in the classroom to have some interesting um, you know games and stories and interactions uh, for students. So just wanted to give people a heads up that a uh, more affordable version of that is now available. All right. Let's keep on heading down the line here. Uh, next up, this one um, got a lot of attention this month, and that was that Google was releasing some new earbuds called Pixel Buds, and the thing that caught everybody's attention was the real-time translation. And so there was a bunch of articles on this. I just grabbed one as an example here. And um, just for a little clarification here, it's not that the earbuds themselves are like 
doing the translation. They're just a piece of it. Turns out that what is really going on here is something we've had for a while that Google has uh, the ability with the Translate app to do live translation. So if I speak in English, my, the Translate app will you know, maybe speak in Spanish, for example, if that's what I wanted it to do. Or I was speaking to somebody who spoke French. They could speak French and then it would translate it and speak that in English. That is not a new thing. You can do that on your phone right now. If you download the Google Translate mobile app on your phone, you can speak to it in one language and it speaks in the other for you. So that that's not new. That's been around for a while. Um, what's happening here, though, is they're now pairing that ability up with these new pixel buds with the idea that if you say you know certain keywords like help me speak Spanish or if you touch a, a button to start the process what will happen is if somebody is speaking to you in a different language as they're speaking to you these earbuds will live translate their words right into your ears so they may be speaking in a language you don't know and you can hear them right in your ears speaking in your preferred language um, so really neat practical application of that tool we've had for a while um, and uh, it just really makes you think <laughs> what uh, what the few what this means for the future of you know world languages and communicating with people and breaking down those barriers between different cultures and being able to communicate with anyone anywhere anytime uh, so uh, again just wanted to clarify that it's not the earbuds themselves that are doing the translation but they're just a new way to easily get that information into your ears uh, they're Bluetooth paired to your phone and it will work with uh, some of the Google phones to start with um, but it is still using their translate a tool in the background all right next up um well go into this one in any detail just to let you know if you are a google admin the reports that you can run on google drive now have a little bit more details they've added some more metrics in there to give you more details on um, your drive activity among your users um, the next one I think is pretty nifty. I do want to investigate this more. So the next thing on the list is that Google has launched a new YouTube creator site. So if you have a YouTube channel or if you haven't and you're like, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to, but I really don't know a whole lot about you know, how to maintain a channel or what would I put on there, you know, but if your school, your class, you as an educator, your students want to have a YouTube channel, they've added um, this new creator site. And if you head over to the link, you'll first get the blog post about it. And if you scroll down just a little in the blog post, there'll be a link that takes you to the creator site. Once you get to the creator site, there's a lot of information here. But the thing that caught my attention when I went to the creator site was across the top, they had some menus and I was hovering above the one that says learn and connect. And what caught my eye was the first link, which was the academy link. So again, the way I got here, just for reference again, I went to the blog post. From the blog post, I went to the YouTube creator site. And then from there, I hovered above the learn and connect option at the top. And I would click on the academy option here. And what they've got is a lot of self-paced learning uh, resources to teach you everything you may ever want to know about having a YouTube channel. And so they've got all of these courses here, foundations for success and um, uh, a master class on uh, YouTube, uh, getting insights with YouTube analytics. And then down the side here are these badges you can earn that as you go through these courses, they've got lessons too. Those are the courses. I can switch it over to lessons instead. And they've got some recommended lessons here, building your community, why branding matters. And then I can earn badges. So I thought, I have not started this one yet. I haven't tried it yet. But I thought, that looks kind of nifty. I think that would be a neat way to learn more about how to make the most out of your YouTube channel. So if that's something that you as an educator are doing currently and want to improve or you just want to get started with, hey, one more resource for you to take a look at. Awesome. All right, next up, um, I won't go into this one just to say they're always adding new things to Street View and they recently added um, a bunch of national parks up in Canada. And so um, they uh, have wonderful Street View collections from all over the world. And if you have not visited Street View recently, uh, please be sure to because they're always adding new educational collections there. Next up, Google launched the Grow with Google program. Now, this is really neat because hopefully this will eventually have uh, a lot of impact for our students as they're graduating and wanting to go get job skills. But let's talk about what it is right now. So Google has launched something called Grow with Google. 
And if you go out to the first link, that'll take you to the blog post that teaches you kind of about it, explains what this is. Basically, what Google wants to do is help people with job skills. They want to uh, have resources for somebody who's hunting for a job, for somebody who wants to improve their skills so that they can be more successful in their job or be able to find a job. They want to be able to help them with their technology skills in preparation for that. So the blog post gives you a little bit of a blurb about it. If you go to the second link there, that'll take you out to the actual site, grow.google, and there's a lot of stuff on the site. Oh my gosh, loads and loads and loads of things here. But the real new thing, the big um, item from all of this. It's actually, if you scroll down a little bit to the section where it talks about job seekers, and there's a spot where they mention enhance your resume with a new certification. So this is for folks, again, who are looking for a job and want to have more technology skills. This is a new certification. If you follow that link, it'll take you out to the page to give you information about it. So kind of like what we have with Google Certified Educator Level 1 and 2, or Google Trainer, or Google Innovator, this this is now going to be a Google Cloud certification, and it covers Drive, Gmail, Hangouts, Docs, Sheets, and Slides. And so it'll be an exam that people can take, and um, then when they pass that exam, they'll have that certification, and it can help them again as they're you know seeking for jobs to say, look, I, I have this certification. So I'm really excited as to what that can mean to you know our students as they're looking at graduating, going to college, but also you know moving on to try to find a job. This may be an, uh, a possible option for them in the future to be able to um, get a certification. Um, right now, the only certifications we've had have been the ones for educators. So really excited about that. Um, I hope to know more about it soon. I did sign up for the beta, so I'm going to try to uh, take that test myself here in the near future and um, see if I can learn a little bit more about what that certification is like. But I uh, wanted to get that on everybody's radars. All right, next up. A um, little bit about Google Slides. So um, we mentioned last month that Google Slides got add-ons. So that's not the new news. We 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 knew that last month. We found out that add-ons have been added to Slides. Uh, Google did a nice blog post about the Lucid Chart add-on. So if you want to read about that, there is a link in there that'll explain a little bit more about that slide add-on. But while I was watching this month, two new add-ons got released for slides. When it launched last month, Lucid Chart was one of them, and there were several others. Um, in the meantime, I've seen two new ones pop up, and I just, I don't have a date for these. I just know sometime during the month they popped up. So I went ahead and just listed them underneath this blog post about the slides add-ons. Um, the two that came up is Photo Slideshow and Slides Toolbox. I'd like to go ahead and demonstrate these for you guys real quick, just so you can see what they are, because I think they really are neat. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of good that we can get with them. So let me go ahead and just fire up my uh, Google Drive here and I'll just create a quick slideshow and show you what uh, this looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and start up a slideshow and give that a second to load up. Here we go. Don't need a theme. Uh, I've already went ahead and I pre-installed these add-ons, but as always, if you're not familiar with add-ons, you simply click on the add-ons menu button and you go on down to the section where it says get add-ons give a click on that, and that will show you all of the available add-ons that you can install. There's not many there yet. <laughs> this is still really, really, really new um, for slides. Uh, if you go to Sheets or Docs, there's hundreds of add-ons. Uh, Forms has several dozen. Uh, slides, obviously, just a handful at the moment. But the ones that caught my attention was Slides Toolbox and photo slideshow. These are the two new ones that caught my attention at least. And so once you get those installed, once you click on them and install them, um, let's show you what they do. So for the first one I'm going to show you is um, the one called photo slideshow. And what photo slideshow does is it will import uh, from either your Google Drive or from your Google Photos albums. It'll import photos and it will put a picture on each slide. It'll basically create a slideshow of your photos. So if you've collected together a whole bunch of pictures from a field trip or from you know a class project, and you've got them all in a drive folder, you've got them all in a photo album, a Google photo album, you do not have to one by one by one by one import those into your slideshow anymore. You can just go ahead and let it do it for you. <laughs> so I'm going to try that out real quick. So from photo slideshow, I'm going to say, let's import from my Google Drive folder. And I've got a folder where I've got some images in that I use for uh, Google Sites training. So let me 
find that folder. It's called uh, Sites Files. Yeah, there's there's the folder, and inside of there, I've got an Images folder. So it just has some public domain images sitting in there. So I'm going to grab that Images folder and say I'm going to select the folder, and it does take it a little bit of time because it's got to pull all those pictures in. But what it's doing now is it's reading from that folder and it's making a slide with each image on a slide. And that's it. Boom. Now, this picture was, I guess, not quite as big, and this one was not as well, but the ones that were large enough, it did fill up the entire slide. So apparently I had a couple of slides, a couple of images there that weren't quite as large, high resolution. Now, of course, I can click on those images and I can stretch them out myself and I can make them bigger and I can crop them and do whatever. But how nice is that? How quickly it just pulls those in and creates um, that slideshow. Um, now, to show you the other one, let's go ahead and make a new slideshow and do the same thing with the other one. The other one is, pull this back up, go to my add-ons. The other one was called um, Slides Toolbox. Now, Slides Toolbox does more than just that, but it also does that. It lets you bring in images and then put those um, uh, on each image on a slide. So if you go to Slides Toolbox and click on tools, it'll open up that panel here on the side and you get a bunch of different tools. Um, import tools is one of them and it does just what we were doing there. It lets you import images um, from your drive and create slides with them. So if I go to import tools and say I want to create slides from images, I can now find that same folder again. So let me find my uh, sites files folder and now this one's a little different. You don't click the folder. You actually have to open the folder and you actually have to select the images. You've got to select the ones you want. Now that's good and bad. I mean, in a sense, it's a little bit more work. You got to select the images, but it's also good because if there was one or two you didn't need, you wouldn't have to grab every one of them and then delete them out of the slideshow later. So you can just select the ones you want. And once you hit select, it's now going to do the same thing. It's going to import those in. And I've noticed it does more of a centering sort of thing. It doesn't necessarily fill the whole slide. It drops them in there and centers them on the slide. Um, and again, it takes it just a little bit of time to pull those in. But here they come. And there we go. And so each slide now has those images in there. Um, there are other tools that it does though besides just importing. It also does exporting, which is really nice. It's the reverse. If you create a slideshow, you can export your entire slideshow, each slide, as images. So I can come in and select you know, all of my slides here and just hold down my shift key, click on the last one. If you're not sure how to do that, all I did, I just clicked on the first one and then I held down my shift key, clicked on the last one and it grabbed all of them. Otherwise, if you use control, control key allows you to pick just certain slides that you want. So shift, and that's not like a Google thing. That's just, that's a computer thing, pretty much any time. Uh, shift grab, shift is like bookends, click one, hold shift, click the other, it grabs everything. Control click allows you to just select which ones you want individually. Um, but if I were to do that and say, I want to spit those out as JPEG images, I could hit export and boom, it would create a uh, zipped file with all of my slides turned into uh, individual images. Uh, I know PowerPoint's done that for a long time. People are saying, hey, PowerPoint could always do that, you know? Well, hey, I'm glad to say we now can do that in Google Slides as well. Now, there are some other tools here as well. There's text tools for changing, you know, capitalization, removing duplicates, getting rid of empty lines, trimming spaces, sorting. If you need to sort things in the slide, that's fantastic. And also some quick removal tools to, to delete things from your slides. So just wanted to give you a heads up that we do have some pretty nifty um, uh, tools coming out for Google Slides now and uh, keep an eye on those. Um, now, Carrie had asked uh, any pros and cons with this versus the extension. It's called uh, Drive Slides. There's an extension from Matt Miller and Alice Keeler called Drive Slides. Um, Good question, Carrie. I would say um, they're very similar in function. I have used Drive Slides for a long time um, since it came out. I love it. I think it's just fantastic. Um, but it's more of a push rather than a pull, I guess. Uh, if you've got Drive Slides, which I'll just turn it on real quick. I, I've got it installed. I'll just turn it back on. So here's Drive Slides. If you have Drive Slides installed, I'll probably have to refresh my screen so it knows that it's there. Um, if I were to do the same thing and go find that folder, 
with my sites files. Let me find it here. Sites files and uh, my image folder. Here it is. There's all my images. If I were to open up the folder that has all those images in there, if I've got drive slides activated, as long as I've got that folder open and I come up here to the drive slides extension and give it a click, it's going to grab everything from that folder and it's going to create a slideshow where it has each of those images put on there. So, you know, functionally very similar. I'm, you know, it's grabbing everything in the folder and it is creating a Google slideshow with each of those in there. So I would say to compare this to uh, the first one we looked at, which was photo slideshow, not really a big difference, I guess. The fact that Photo Slideshow also lets you pull from Google Photos albums as well as drive folders. Um, probably the only real difference would be as if we compared it to the Slides Toolbox, only because it lets you selectively choose individual pictures rather than grabbing the whole folder. But hey, what a, what a great problem to have. <laughs> More ways to do something, you know, so that's great. Yeah, so whether you are going to work out of the drive and say, I'd rather click the extension and push them to a slideshow, or I'm already in a slideshow and I'd rather pull them in. Hey, you, you got you got options coming and going. How about that? So uh, that's fantastic. So thank you for the question, Carrie. I appreciate you uh, mentioning that. And by the way, Carrie, since I see you're in the meeting here, please do feel free to uh, head back up to the upcoming event section. If there's anything from the uh, Tylo group coming up that you wanted to highlight as far as upcoming webinars or things, please do feel uh, feel free to add that in there. For those that don't know, there is a, a group called Tylo or Tilo, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It's the Technology Integration Integration Leaders of Ohio. Um, and uh, the Tylo group is for tech integration folks all over the state of Ohio. And there's a lot of times uh, excellent um, uh, webinars that get put on by members uh, throughout Ohio and uh, other activities and so forth. So uh, thanks for being here, Carrie. And uh, definitely please feel free to share some of that. I think you had a call out recently for people to submit webinars. So if you even want to throw a link into that, um, that would be fantastic. So people know how to um, submit their uh, webinars uh, to um, to you. All right, um, let's keep on going. A little bit of space stuff next. Um, Google Maps has added planets and moons. Okay, now there's some articles. If you want to read them, please feel free to go ahead and read the articles, but it's just a little more fun to show you. So I'm going to head over to Google Maps and show you this. It's pretty schnazzy. So once I get to Google Maps, as normal, nothing special right now. I'm just at regular old Google Maps. I'm going to switch to satellite view. And I'm going to start backing up. Now, as I start scrolling back, and I'm seeing Ohio and the Great Lakes and more of the country. Now, keep on scrolling back, and suddenly there's the whole Earth. Now, don't stop there. Keep on scrolling back. Keep going. Keep going. Keep scrolling. And suddenly, oh my gosh, if you scroll out far enough from Google Maps, you suddenly go so far back that instead of just having Earth, you now can see all of these other planets. So I can say, awesome, let's check out Mars. Earth goes away and here's Mars. And we can zoom in on Mars and do everything with that that we do with Google Earth as well. Um, so now we can visit all of these different planets and zoom in and see them. Um, zoom way back out. And if you zoom out far enough, oh, I hit it to the side, zoom out far enough, you get, again, your little uh, bar on the side. And you've got, uh, not every planet's here, but there's a lot of moons and a lot of planets uh, that are in there. So fantastic. You don't even have to do anything special. Just go to Google Maps and zoom out, and you can get to all of these great resources that are there. All right. Good stuff. Now, before we leave space, let's actually jump ahead just a couple, because if you go down a little bit further, there's another one about Mars specifically, and that Google has launched a new website uh, where you can explore a 3D rendered version of Mars. So I'm going to go ahead. There's a blog post, and then this link takes you right to the actual site. I'm going to head over to it. It's accessmars.withgoogle.com, and I'm going to go ahead and enter into the site. It does take it just a moment to load. So I will click on it now just so it does load while I'm talking. Um, and basically, here's the idea. What they did was when the, uh, the uh, rover was uh, 
has been running around on Mars and recording and taking pictures of everything. What they've done is they've taken all of that data, all of those images that have been collected um, by the rover, and they have now, there we go, I'll close out of that. There we go. Um, so now they've taken all of those images and they have built a 3D version of Mars based upon those. And so you can click on these different um, items to learn about the different spots, or there's a map button you can click on and you can jump to different areas and it'll actually shoot you out to that area of Mars. And once it loads, you can then go exploring. So if I just wanna look around, that's fine. But if I wanna jump to locations, I just go ahead and click and I drive over to those locations. And it's like street view for Mars. I can just drive all over the surface of Mars. So this is actually what it would truly look like to be on Mars using all of the scans and photographs that we have collected because of our Curiosity rover up there on Mars. Awesome stuff. So a lot of really good uh, science space resources for us this month. All right, next up, what else do we need to check off for what's new in Google? Um, Real quick, we don't need to go into this one in any great detail, just heads up for the administrators. Um, when you have had a, a an account deleted in the past, you used to have five days to recover the account, you now have 20 days. So if an account gets, if you, an account is deleted, you now have a 20 day window to restore that account in full. Uh, next up, Chrome has increased some security features. Again, we really don't need to spend a lot of time on this, just heads up, if you happen to get a evil extension <laughs> installed on your uh, on your Chrome browser that starts taking over stuff. It does happen. That can occur. Like maybe it tries to change what your home page is or change your search engine. Um, Chrome now is going to be aware better of this hijacking and will pop up and say, hey, just heads up. <laughs> Something just changed your default search engine to this other thing. Is that really what you wanted? Uh, and also if there's something uh, from an extension or, or, or other tool that gets installed that Chrome feels is um, potentially malicious, it's going to do a scan uh, more and more of your Chrome browser and let you know, hey, just heads up, we found some harmful software on your computer and we can help you fix that. We can, we can clean that up. Would you like us to do that? So if you do see these things popping up, they are okay. They're good, actually. Sometimes we wonder, is that a legitimate pop-up? Should I be you know, trusting that? Uh, yes, Google has added some new features into Chrome to help protect you even a little bit more. All right, keep on going. Uh, next one, just mentioning it because it's cool. Uh, Google Photos can now recognize your pets. Okay, <laughs> so uh, if you've known Google Photos for a long time has been able to recognize people's faces. So if you use Google Photos, which I do, I love it, love it, love it, love it. I can go in and say, this is my daughter, this is my son, this is my you know wife, this is me. And I can you know, attach our names to uh, the faces and then Google Photos will look through all of my photos and say, okay, you said, Eric, this is you. I think these other 137 photos are probably you also because it looks like the same person person. And so you can just label a few photos and then it goes through and labels all of your photos for you. And then you can say, hey, give me all the pictures of, you know, my son um, for his birthday coming up here. I want to do a video of him. You know, I can say, you know, pull up all the pictures of him and it would just pull all those pictures for me. Now that's not new. It's done that. It's done that for a very long time. They were just announcing that it works for your pets now too. <laughs> so if you have pictures of your pet, you can say, this is my dog Kida and, uh, or this is my cat Dribbles, which that is actually their name um, or my guinea pig. I have a guinea pig and for those of you that are nerdy techie people his name is literally Scratch 2.0. Uh, now this was not meant to be a nerdy joke. <laughs> those of you who you do uh, computer programming you know there is um, a, a tool called Scratch and there's a you know a, a new version it came out at some point Scratch 2.0 um, and it's for kids to learn programming. Um, that was not the intention. <laughs> One of my boys named our, our guinea pig Scratch uh, that we got many, many, many years ago because I guess he was scratching things. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, at one point and so they got another guinea pig and they decided to name him Scratch 2.0. <laughs> so not that you needed to know that uh, th those secrets of my life there, but there you go. So <laughs> a little bit of a uh, idea about my pets. So yes, Dribbles the cat, Keita the dog, and Scratch 2.0 the guinea pig. Uh, Google, uh, Google Photos can now 
recognize them for me <laughs> if I want them to. So again, it's just back to the AI and the machine learning. It's really, really neat how Google is able to do more and more of this stuff to uh, uh, take care of the busy work so we can focus on what we do best. And think about that. I know we're talking pet photos, but it's the same idea. Machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's going to, over time, impact our education system more and more because it's going to do the busy work. It's going to do the repetitious things. It's going to look at the student data from the tests that they take and it's going to see the patterns and it's going to summarize things so that that work can be done by the computer and then we as educators can do what we do best which is to connect with the kids and to individualize with them and to help find what we can do to um, you know help them grow and be more creative and work together so it is going to impact education but right now that is just pet photos all right uh, next up, Google Calendar gets a facelift. Yeah, so um, hopefully you have an you have access to this now. Uh, uh, over the last couple of weeks, Google's been rolling out access to the new look of Google Calendar, and it was definitely needed. Calendar was definitely one of the programs that. Compared to the others, it was looking a little different. It was looking kind of old, the menus and, and this, especially the settings. You know, the settings really looked like they'd been that way for many, many years. They weren't reflecting the new design scheme that Google typically uses in their programs. Um, so um, that should be available to you now. Let me go ahead and drag over to this main screen another account here that has the old version. I'm just going to show you what it looks like to switch to the new. So here's the idea. If you have access to the new version, when you go to Google Calendar, what you'll notice is up in the top right, you should have a button that says use new calendar. If that's not there yet, that just means either one, it hasn't made it to your domain yet, okay, it's still rolling out, or number two, your Google Apps administrator may not have allowed it. This is something, if you're an administrator, you do need to go into your admin console, you need to go to um, the calendar settings, and you need to choose whether or not people are allowed to use the new calendar yet. Now, eventually, they're going to get it. I mean, it's 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 coming, you know. The old calendar is going to go away, everybody's going to get the new calendar. By the way, I had a bunch of people ask me, what about all, all the events on my calendar? Will they transfer over? It's not like that. It's not like a new program. It's just a new way of looking at your calendar. So your data is not going anywhere. Any, any event you've got, it's fine. All your events, everything's there. It's not a new version of calendar that things need to be moved or anything. It's just a new way to look at it. The data in the background is staying the same. We're just getting a facelift on how we view all of those events. So if you do have the option, you just go to the top right and click use new calendar and let it upgrade. And there you go. You're now in the new calendar. Now what's different about it? Well, basically the biggest difference right now is cosmetic. You know, it just, it looks a little prettier. So if I go to my week view or I go to my, you know, um, day view or month view or my schedule view, it's just a little bit cleaner. Now this account, I barely have, this is just a demo account. This is a test account here. Um, but if there was other stuff on there, it might be a little, a little bit more interesting to look at. Uh, but the point is, yeah, this is a much cleaner uh, layout. Um, and I do like, I really do like how on the left-hand side, if you don't want to view a calendar, in the past, you would just simply click on it to toggle it on and off. Well, you still do the same, but I think it's a little bit more intuitive now because if you noticed down the left, there's actually check boxes with a little check mark in them to let you know, hey, you are displaying this calendar. But if I click on the check box and uncheck it, then it tells me, hey, you're not displaying that anymore. And then I click on it again. It says, now you're displaying it again. So I think that's more intuitive than what it used to be in the past. People weren't always sure, how do I hide calendars? Well, that's the idea. It's the checkbox. And I think that's a little bit more clear now. As far as what is different about it, just a couple of things. Uh, so for example, uh, some of the new things include that when you're doing, a, if, you, if, you do, if you do resources, if your school does what they call resources or booking a room. Um, your Google Apps administrator can now include more details about the room or the resource that you're booking. Used to be you only got the title of it. Now you can find out more about it. Like what, you know, what, uh, what amenities does that room have? Does it have, you know, a, a 
a projector or you know whatever. Now it's not always rooms. You can use this to check out carts of laptops. You can use this feature to check out you know projectors or whatever. But the point is, you can put in a lot more descriptors than you used to be able to with that. What I really like about the new one, though, is the rich formatting that you have now. So if I come here and say I want to create an event, when I go in to create an event, if I were to come here and say let's make an event, when I go in to create the event, I like the fact that in the description box, you now have rich formatting buttons here. You didn't used to have that. Your description was just text. Now you can do bold and italics and underline and bullets, and you can easily add links. Now, I used to add links to my descriptions, but I had to put HTML in there, and it was quite a lot to jump through the hoops to make it happen. Now I can just type in some text, hit my little link button, and I can easily add a hyperlink to the description of an event. So somebody who's going to the event could click the link to get more details, visit the corresponding website that goes along with the conference or whatever the thing might be. So I thought that was pretty slick. I do like that. All right. So if you um, haven't gotten to it yet, it should be available to you very, very soon here. Um, taking a look here while we're chatting about, I'm seeing some of the, the uh, comments come in here in the, uh, in the chat, just seeing if we have anything in there that we need to address. Um, do, 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 says the new calendar, um, the switch is February 28th of 2018 is when uh, Classic completely um, goes away. So thank you, Andreas, for sharing that. I did not recall the exact date, but February 28th of uh, 2018 is when that um, Classic version of Calendar will be uh, discontinued. So you will need to make the switch between now and then. All right, very good, looks good. Good stuff, guys. All right, again, please feel free to continue to throw comments into either the YouTube chat feature or go ahead and uh, add things here to the um, uh, to the uh, agenda docket as well. Um, do, do, do. Uh, Carrie says um, that she loves the ability to do, uh, yeah, the links in there. I'm right there with you, Carrie, absolutely. Not having to do all that HTML coding in the description. Oh my gosh, isn't that nice? Yeah, it really is. So I'm very happy about that. All right, let's keep going. Um, next up, not a, not a new thing, just an announcement, just a, a blog post. Google mentioned that um, Chromebooks have now become the highest selling educational device in Canadian K-12 schools. So uh, we've seen the same thing happen here in the US. Um, Chromebooks have now become the most commonly sold educational device for schools in Canada. And I've got a lot of Canadian friends. I don't know if any of them are watching here or listening right now or later, but uh, I will tell you, um, I'm so proud, of course, of you know being here in the US and all the awesome things we're doing. But guys, there are some amazing Canadian educators um, out there. Um, and I've had such a privilege and pleasure to meet so many of them at different conferences. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to work with them. But uh, they are just some awesome, awesome folks. So uh, they are doing a good job and it's showing because um, uh, Chromebooks are having a lot of success in Canada as well. All right. Uh, next up, not going to spend a lot of time on this one, uh, but Google launches add-ons for Gmail. Now, when you see the title, you're like, oh, this is phenomenal. I'm so excited. We're getting add-ons for Gmail. And I am excited. Please don't get me wrong. I am excited that we are getting add-ons for Gmail. Just to temper the excitement a little bit, though, they're very business-oriented at the moment. So uh, we did know this was coming. Google announced this, I think, at like their I.O. conference or something. Were, we, we saw this months ago. They did mention this was coming. So we kind of knew it was on its way. If you go and look at the blog post, I am very excited about this. It's just, I think we have to wait just a little bit to get some that are probably more education centric, unless you're using some of these tools, which you very well may be. So it's a lot of project management tools. It's a lot of uh, HR tools. It's a lot of, you know, like DocuSign and um, uh, Smart Sheet and Streak and Trello and Ring Central. And it's a lot of things that I think a business 
would absolutely flip over. They're gonna be so excited. Now, having said that, I know a lot of you guys do a lot of project management. You may be a technology director or curriculum manager or something, and you're like, no, we actually do a lot of project management. We've got big projects we're working on. And so if you're using something like Asana or some of those tools that are for those sort of project management tasks, uh, you now have add-ons in Gmail that will make it easier to take an email message and send it right over to Asana or send it over to whatever project management tool you are using. I don't do a lot with those tools, so I am uh, excited, but um, going to be patient and wait to see what else comes out um, that I may be able to take advantage of. Now, having said that, I'd love to hear from you guys. If some of you are like, Going to be able to take advantage of these right now please let us know how how you do that you know what which of these add-ons are you excited about because you know it's going to fit in wonderfully to your workflow yep all right good job uh, if anybody's using them i'm going to guess it's probably andreas and uh yes he does a lot of project management uh so um i seeing andreas chatting a little bit there in the chat window that uh these may be valuable for him and he was the first person that came to my mind when i saw this we already talked about Google Assistant getting the kid-friendly commands. Uh, so the next one, uh, almost at the end of our updates here, is Google Sites gives you greater nesting of pages now. So this is pretty cool. Let's head over to Sites and we'll take a quick look at this. So if I go to Google Sites, um, I'm just going to bring up the site I was working on for boot camp yesterday. These are all just demo sites. These are not real, real sites that I'm trying to work on or anything like that. These are just demo sites from trainings. Uh, I'm just going to open up the one I was playing around with in our boot camp yesterday just to show you real quick the idea behind this. So the idea of having pages um, in um, Google Sites and having those pages be in a drop down menu. That is not new. We've had that for a while. So for example, I'll pull my photo gallery out for a moment. Yep, photo gallery, come on. Mm -hmm. Pull you out there. Okay. So it used to be uh, that if you had pages running down the side here, uh, they would put links across the top. That's very normal. And we could grab a page and say, you know what? I want this page to be a sub page of another page. I'll put my photo gallery underneath my class videos page. And you would simply drag and drop it onto that link on the right and then now if you go up to your top menu photo gallery is a drop down underneath class video so that's not new we've had that for a while what's new is that now you can do up to five levels deep so if i wanted my class docs to be underneath my photo gallery which is underneath my class videos i realize those may not make sense the, that particular collection of, of pages but the point is you can keep doing this as deep as five levels down so now i've got class videos photo gallery docs and calendar again i wouldn't actually do those in that order it'd be more like you know subject area maybe grade level or maybe subject area and chapter or unit and then you know inside of there uh, further breakdown by topic or something like that but now if i come up to class videos i've got a photo gallery click the down arrow i get class docs click the down arrow i get calendar and so i can have up to five levels deep of branching um, menus in google sites something that i know people are uh, very excited about it had been uh, uh, clearly missing from the early versions of google sites and so it's nice to have that available to us now all right and the last thing what is our final update the final update is science journal all right science journal is not new we've had science journal for a while uh, i don't know that it's well known but it, it's not new it's a mobile app science journal is a mobile app and um what it does is it allows you to use whatever sensors you have on your mobile device and it allows you to record data from those sensors for like scientific experiments okay um so it's again it's been around for a while it's, it's it's not new i think probably at least a year and a half or so i think we've had it what's new is it was only on android so first of all the big new thing is it's now on ios so android and ios users can now use this so it's going to work on your phone it's going to work on your tablet and if you've got a Chromebook that runs Android apps, it's going to work on your Chromebook running the Android apps. Now, what else is new is they've added more sensors to it now. It used to be that basically all it would do was it would, um, uh, it did volume. It did like sound, how loud sound was. It did light, how bright light was. 
And then it did um, acceleration in three dimensions. So up and down, right and left, forward and backwards. Okay, so that's what it did. Now they've added uh, barometer, they've added magnetism, they've added um, uh, a, a compass uh, option. Um, and so you can now record with way more uh, sensors. Now, of course, your phone has to have those sensors. If your phone doesn't have a barometer, it's it's not going to work. But if it does, it will. Now, let me see if I can show this to you real quick. Um, bum, 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 bum. Let me uh, plug in my phone. This is always a bit of a challenge because it doesn't always work, but I'm going to plug in my phone and see if I can put my phone up on the screen here for you guys. Let's give it a shot and see if it comes up okay here today. Here it comes. Now I use a free version of Visor. Visor is a uh, an app for Chrome uh, that lets you put your phone up there. I do use the free version, the free version, so I do get ads. <laughs> so uh, there may be ads popping up. I cannot account for what they may be. So <laughs> just fair warning. I don't know <laughs> what what ads are going to pop up on the screen here. Um, but so if something bad comes up, I apologize. Oh, good. It's just Google Play. We can take that off of there. Um, so let me go ahead and fire up the Science Journal app here. Here it is on my phone. And so basically, if I go in uh, to my Science Journal app here, what you'll notice is at the bottom, I have um, a, a button for all of my different sensors. So first of all, there's light. I'll point it toward the window. Gets the, the lux value goes up. I'll point it away from the window and it goes down. Here's sound. If I talk really loud, it'll go up. And if I talk really quiet, it'll go down. And then I've got things like a linear accelerometer. I've got accelerometer in the X, Y, and Z direction. I've got my barometer. I've got my compass. So I point this in different directions. And I've got my magnometer. My magnometer. Magnometer? Yeah, okay, yeah. It measures magnetism. There you go. That's what it does. Uh, now, the point is, I can take any one of these and hit record. And now it's starting to record. So as I'm talking, as I talk really, really, really loud, it gets high. And when I talk really, really, really quiet, it falls down. And the point is it's recording that. And when I'm all done, it, whoop, say I'm all done, stop. There we go, did it stop? Okay, it's still recording. I have to be able to tell it to stop now. There we go. Okay, maybe it's, maybe I haven't figured out how to make it stop. So it's gonna record forever. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, stop, go away, stop recording. Oh, okay. Well, I'll figure it out. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, but I've used this before. I actually went to Cedar Point, and I I held it on the Gemini while I was uh, while I was uh, riding on the Gemini. And um, what I did was I used the accelerometer, uh, the uh, the one that goes up and down uh, for like you know height for like I guess the z axis that would be, and it was awesome. It was really neat because as I'm riding the Gemini. It's, uh, you know, showing when I'm, you know, in zero G's coming out of my seat and when I'm getting, you know, plastered back down in the seat. So, um, but it's a great tool to let kids bring in real world data. And once you record it, you can then, um, you know, take notes on it. You can export it file that can be pulled into Google Sheets so you can then do additional studies with it. Um, and in addition to all of that, um, not only have they released the new version that has all the new features, but they've also linked in a cool website that goes along with this. So don't miss that. If you scroll to the bottom of the article, there's a link that says they released more than 20 new activities. If you follow that link, it'll take you out to their Making Science website, their Making and Science website. And they've got a whole bunch of activities that you can do by pre-made lesson plans and activities using um, the Science Journal app on your mobile device. So again, just definitely want to let people know that that is uh, updated. It's available for Android and iOS now with uh, new sensors and a lot of great practical um, activities to use with it. All right, let's see. I think that should be the end of what's new. Going to take a look around and see if there's anything else popping up with questions or comments before we take the turn for Q&A and show and tell. Um, doot, 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 doot. I see uh, Peggy said calendar used to have an add-on for world clock that displayed right on the calendar page. Is that available in the new calendar format or is there an alternative? Oh, I don't know, Peggy. Um, in the update info, they said not all add-ons are available, Carrie says, yet, but check and see. 
Um, all right, so um, we may not have all of the, now I don't know if they were called add-ons or are we talking about um, labs? Um, in the old version, we had what was called uh, calendar labs rather than add-ons. That may be what you're referring to there. Um, and by the way, you can always switch back. If you go up to your gear in the new version of calendar, you can say back to classic. You know, say, why do you want to go? And you say, oh, I just want to head back to classic. And when you get back to classic, yeah, we used to have, um, if you went up to the gear icon in the top uh, right, there was what was called labs, calendar labs. And you could turn on all these different labs for extra cool features. There's that world clock one that Peggy was talking about. Um, I guess what the question is, is do those work in the new version? And I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. Let's go down and turn on the word world clock and hit save so that we've got world clock turned on. So now there's my world clock up there in the top right. But if I switch over to new calendar, am I going to lose those labs? I do not see it coming through on the new one. And I don't know that I saw labs yet. So yeah, so maybe not. Maybe it's not available yet, or maybe they're, that's still coming, or maybe labs are going away and they're becoming add-ons, like Gmail has add-ons now. Of course, Gmail still has labs, too, so it's got both. Gmail has labs and add-ons. Add I don't know. Interesting. We'll see. All right. I don't see anything else there. I'm looking at the chat on the other side, and I don't see anything there at the moment that I think think we need to address. But if I'm missing something, guys, you holler at me. Let me know if there's something that I did not see. Um, just uh, put it in the chat or add it to the doc and highlight it in yellow or something so I don't miss it. All right. All right. Well, let's go ahead and head into the, our uh, second big portion of our meeting each month, which is Q&A and show and tell. So with Q&A, basically, hey, if you got questions, hopefully somebody out there has an answer and can help out. And so um, uh, let's see what we've got uh, today. Uh, we do have a question here saying, I'm trying to attach a document as an announcement in Google Classroom. And every document gives me the error. I don't have permission to share this document. Please help. I must be missing something. Now, Matt Mays did reply to this, I see. And that was my first thought. What Matt said is make sure you're the owner of the document, that you have rights to share it. Uh, Nicole's saying, though, that she is the owner. She goes, I can go in and create a new one. And it gives me the same message. I can even make a copy of the document and try to attach it. And it gives me the same message. I'm using Classroom that I created. It's got her stumped. Well, Nicole, um, I don't have an answer for you right off the top of my head, but Nicole, you are in one of the districts that um, we serve through Spark, and I will be more than happy to help you in any way I can. I'm a little curious about this. I think probably I'm going to want to sit down with you and um, jump into your admin console and take a look at some of your settings. And uh, so let's see if we can... Uh, jumping up even if we just do a hangout sometime um you know we can do that uh you're, you're not that far away from uh where i'm at in my offices though so i can certainly head over to uh your location at your school as well if need be now if anybody has an answer for nicole in the meantime um please let us know because I'm just going to be poking a stick at it. <laughs> I do not have an answer. So it's going to be me trying out five different things and seeing if any of them work. So if anybody does have a suggestion for Nicole, uh, we would definitely be glad to hear that. So sorry, we don't have an answer, but um, I will follow up with you, Nicole. Uh, next up, I'm looking for some mystery Skype calls for Friday, January 10th. Um, if anybody has connections. Or leads let me know all right so for this one i went ahead and pasted these in here as some ideas for where to start if other people have other suggestions though please put them in here if you want to do any kind of a connection now i didn't know it's called mystery skype here but it can be a mystery hangout you know the same idea whether it's using skype or google hangouts um, there are a bunch of websites that help people connect. For example, the Connected Classroom community is a great one for that. If you follow this link, it'll take you out to that community. It is a Google Plus community with over 25, almost 26,000 members. And this is what they do. This is all it's about, is people saying, I'm looking for 
a class that's this grade level or in this country or in this state or that wants to deal with this topic, hey, who can hook up? Who can, you know, connect with me on this? So this is a wonderful place to reach out to almost 26,000 educators. Uh, the other two below are very similar, smaller communities, but very similar. And then we've got uh, Katie Seamer, who is um, an Ohio uh, native. She is one of our co-leaders of GEG Ohio. She's a Google certified trainer and innovator down in the Cincinnati area. As an innovator, her project for a Google as a Google innovator was what was called Classroom Bridges. And so Katie has created this site. I went ahead and added this in as another one I would encourage you to investigate. Basically, it's a spot where you can go and register your class to say, hey, we would like to connect with other classes. And uh, so what you do is you come in here and you can, you know, click on the get started and you can, you know, register yourself. Or if we go to find a classroom, what it's going to do is show you classrooms all over the world who are um, doing this. So if I scroll on down, here's a map. And below there, I can narrow it down by country or time zone or whatever. And then here's all of the different folks. Uh, she has 261 people around the world who are willing to connect. And so that's another great place to go to start connecting. So those are my suggestions on that one. If you guys have um, others, please do share those. Uh, next up, Google Earth is requesting parental permission in order for our K-12 students to use it when our admin tries to turn it on for our domain. How have districts handled this? I don't understand why parental permission is needed for Google Earth. Now, this is a topic that came up last month. So I'm going to pull up last month's agenda. I did add in some follow-up on this from last month. Now, this may not totally answer your question. If so, I apologize, but I hope this gets you closer to what you're trying to um, get at here. So last month, we were talking about um, Google, um, make sure I'm in the right spot here. Yes, Google Earth. Last month, we were talking about Google Earth. We were talking about it with a lot of different topics, you know, talking about, you know, um, lit trips and all sorts of things, Google Earth related. And that topic was coming up about how, huh, when I try to use Google Earth, it's saying, you know, you must be a certain age to use this and so forth. And it was kind of... Um, throwing up a lot of red flags for people, understandably. This is not a new concern. Uh, I think probably over the last three months, I've seen a lot of people asking about it. Now, I did not find this information myself. I apologize. I'm not going to be able to credit who found it. Uh, if I dug, I probably could. But somebody went in and they were able to take a picture of the terms of service as it was about a month ago, and then the terms of service as it is now. And you will see there is there has been a, at least somewhat of a change in the Google Earth terms of service. It used to say, do not use Google Earth for anyone under the age of 13. And suddenly people were like, what? So my, my, my sixth graders can't, my seventh graders can't use Google Earth and my little ones can't use Google Earth. And um, that had been the original um, terms of service for Google Earth, but they removed that criteria. And now it says um, there is no age limit, like you can't be too young to use it. That's gone now. They've taken that out. But they still say this phrase, if you have end users under the age of 18, you have to have parental consent. Okay. Now, that sounds weird. I get it. But it's actually not at all. All. This is absolutely not a weird thing. It may not even be what you're thinking it is, okay? Here's the idea, folks. For your students to use anything in G Suite, Gmail, Docs, Slides, Sheets, Calendar, anything in G Suite, you have to have parental permission. That's what your district signs when you sign up for G Suite. When you say, we're going to go Google, there is an agreement form that somebody, your superintendent, your treasurer, somebody signs that says, we agree to this. That's why every school has, should, I can't imagine they don't, some sort of acceptable use policy. Now, you may not call it an acceptable use policy. In Ohio, that's a common term, AUP, acceptable use policy. It can be something totally different in your in your state. But pretty much every school has that. And it's something that you have parents sign for their kids. And it says, if you're going to use technology in our district, 
these are the things that we need permission for. And parents read it and they sign it and they say, I give permission for my child to use these resources. You don't have to spell them all out. You don't, you don't have to say, these are the 25 tools we're gonna use. You say things like computer software, including things you know, installed locally, as well as cloud-based services, you know, including things such as G Suite for education, but not limited to that. You know, it says things like that. And it may say something like, and it does not matter whether you're on school property or not, if you're using a school, um, an account, if you're using a school account, even if you're at home or on a field trip or somewhere else, these, these still apply. You still need to use these ethically and responsibly and, you know, not, you cannot harass people and things like that. So you're already doing this. And if you're not, there's way bigger problems here if you're not already doing this. That's something that every school already has to be doing just to be using G Suite. So let's put it this way. If your kids are using G Suite, 99.9% .9 they better have signed an AUP already. Well, they haven't, their parents have, their parents signed it. Their parents have signed it. And that's all this is saying, that's it. You're, you're covered, okay? If, they're, if you're using G Suite and your parents have signed the AUP, that's exactly what this is saying, is that if you're under the age of 18, you need to have that parental permission. So uh, so I think, I hope that answers your question. And if I have said something incorrect, um, anybody who's listening and you know better, please correct me. I do not want to misspeak on that. That's a serious issue as far as AUPs and all those sort of things. Uh, but that is my understanding of that. And I hope that clears that up a little bit as to what that is. They, you need parental permission for G Suite period. You know, you just have to have it anyway. The nice thing is they got rid of that 13 years of age restriction that we had um, on earth originally. So that is gone now, which is good. We like that. All right. Um, I did see a question came up saying, uh, Eric, do you or anyone else have AUPs that you can share with us? Our district has an AUP that needs an overhaul. Yeah, Joyce, I am sure a lot of people do. And my quick answer is yes, we do. There is a, um, at Spark where I work, we do have a, um, like a demo, or a demo, a draft, a sample, a model, whatever. We do have a model AUP and most of our districts, I think, base theirs off of it. Um, Joyce, if you want to drop me an email to remind me of that, I will be more than happy to send you uh, whatever that model AUP is that we give to our districts. If anybody else has one, though, and you would like to maybe throw it into the document around this area where we're talking about AUPs and you want to link that in, please feel free to do so. I think people would greatly appreciate being able to see other examples of acceptable use policies. Um, and again, I will try to, I'll try to remember to do the same thing. I do, I can't put my hand on it right now. I, I'd have to think where I, where it's at. Um, but I will try to remember to come back and link that in here as well. Um, I'll even just put a little indent here and just put in like AUPs or something like that. So I don't forget about it. And then, you know, I can, um, oh, looks like Andreas is going to put in the streets borough AUP. That would be phenomenal. Thank you very much. Or AUA in your case. Okay. All right. So I assume that's acceptable use agreement rather than policy. Thanks. Thanks very much. All right. Um, next up, uh, if we upgrade our Google Calendar and have hyperlinks in our events, will others be able to see the hyperlinks or do they have to be using the upgraded calendar? Well, that's a good question. Um, we can, we can, we can, check real quick. I don't think it's going to be a problem. Um, uh, I have a bunch of ones that I did with hyperlinks in the old version of calendar. Let's see if they're working in the new one. So let's go to my Google calendar and let's find something where I did a webinar. Let me find a webinar I did recently. Here we go. This one should be it. All right, so this is the webinar I did recently on Google Forms for online assessments. And I had hard-coded in with HTML. I had hard-coded in a link and it looks like it came through just fine. Yep, so it's it's showing up fine in the new version. It's actually just showing up as a link like that. When I looked at it in the old version, I actually saw the HTML when I went to edit it. And nope, it looks like it's coming through just fine. So if you had put in, hard-coded HTML links in your old descriptions, they seem to make the trip just fine into the new version. It looks good. All right. 
All right, that looks like that's it for the Q&A. We'll, we'll take another peek at the end and see if anything else shows up in there. And if so, um, we'll swing back around to that. Uh, but thank you guys so much for your questions and answers for those who've been able to provide additional resources. And that brings us to what I think is one of the funnest parts of the entire thing, all the neat, cool stuff. Not that everything else isn't cool. I love all the other things too, but the show and tell section. So show and tell is all about what is a, a neat resource? What's a neat way to use Google tools that you've come across in the last month? Again, I try to collect these all month long. So when I'm on Twitter or Google Plus or Facebook or blogs or podcasts, anytime I go, hey, that sounds cool. I copy it and paste it into this document. And I just build this document all month long. And as you can see, this was a busy month. Now, I am not going to try to go through all of these. I Ahead of time, I uh, gave myself some notes about a few that I definitely wanted to reference. Having said that, if I don't reference one, it doesn't mean it's not important. Please do uh, check click on any and every one of these. There definitely may be some things here that uh, speak to you and you want to follow up. And also anybody who wrote these blog posts, um, just the fact that I'm skipping over you uh, does not mean any slight to you. I, I greatly appreciate the fact that you shared these things and that's why I've got them linked in here. It just for the sake of time, I'll probably just mention a handful of these uh, specifically, but I would encourage you to investigate each of them. Um, so the very first spot at the top is just some things I posted over the last month. So just to draw your attention to those real quick. Um, the first one is I did a blog post on summarization tools. Now, the reason I did this, I was doing a presentation on special needs, um, uh, uh, accessibility, accommodation, things like that. And you may know, I've actually got a blog post out there um, that is all about special needs. So if you go to my Control Alt Achieve page and you go to resources and you go down to accommodations, I have a blog post on Chrome extensions for struggling students and special needs. And this is a very uh, popular blog post. It's been one that I think has gotten you know a, a lot of attention over the years. It's a it's an excellent collection of great resources. Well, I needed to update it. I realized you know well. This was October of 2016, so this has been a year ago. And I said, you know, I need to make sure these tools are all still working. So I went back through and I updated the entire blog post. So this, this blog post, it's the same one as before, but it's completely updated with tools in case some, anything was no longer accurate. This used to be 21 extensions, and now it's like 30, I think or so, maybe 31. So there's a whole lot more in here than there used to be just because there have been a lot of new tools that have come out. Um, and so now it's up to, yep, it's up to 31. So it's 31 extensions to help students with accommodation and accessibility needs. So while I was doing that though, one thing that really jumped out to me as I was cleaning it up and, you know, taking the bad links out and putting in new things in their place, what really jumped out to me was summarization tools. This has been one that's really hard to nail down a lot of times. Uh, these extensions, they seem to pop up and a few months later, they, they go away. It's like, ah, I have a hard time finding good summarization tools. Uh, I was really happy this time though to find a bunch that seemed to be very stable and hopefully will keep running for us. So the idea behind a summarization tool is it would be something that if you had an article to read, you could click on the extension or the bookmark widget or whatever the tool is, and it would take that article and it would give you a summarized version of it. It would give you a simpler, condensed version of it. And that could be great for students who maybe need a shortened version of the article because of some uh, reading struggles they may have, or it could be great just for an advanced organizer. Hey, I'm going to read the whole thing, but before I do, what are the key points? You know, let me kind of look at this real quick and see, you know, uh, so that, that can be helpful really for any student whatsoever. And so there are seven here. Take a look at them. Um, I, I, I like uh, summary. That's a great one. It's a bookmark widget and it lets you say how many sentences you want and it summarizes the article down. And then TLDR. I loved TLDR. That uh, stands for too long, didn't read. Uh, that one used to be one of my favorites and it went away. Turned out um, they had been involved in some kind of legal thing and they had to copyright stuff, how to fix stuff, whatever. And hey, they're back and it's better than ever. And so TLDR has resurrected and it's back and it's an extension you click on. And again, it gives you a short, medium and long version of the article you're reading. But there's seven of those here between the seven of them. Hopefully some of them will click for you as something that is valuable for you and or your students. Um, and so that one I wanted to draw attention to. Um, 
what else is recently on my blog, um, two webinars. So these are the two webinars from last month. If you missed these webinars, uh, this will get you to them. The first is Google Tour Builder for any subject. So that link will take you out to the blog post I did on using Google Tour Builder for science, social studies, math, language arts, how students can build their own tours and annotate them with images and videos and descriptions and links and stuff. It is a one hour webinar, just like all of our webinars are. At the end of the webinar, you can take a short quiz to prove you watched it and get your certificate of attendance. Uh, but the webinar is there as well as the slideshow, as well as all of the resources mentioned in the webinar. They're all linked in there for you. Um, now that I think about it, I do need to include a uh, if Matt will let me, uh, Matt Mays has created some fantastic tours, a tour builder. And uh, Matt, if I can get your permission, I would love to add yours to the list of sample tours here. So when people are looking at this, they can also see the, ex the excellent examples you have created as well. So that webinar is available. Uh, the next link down is the second webinar I did last month, which was on Google Forms. So 24 tips for Google Forms quizzes. This is one that I had done a webinar on about two and a half years ago or so, I don't know, quite a while back, I had done a webinar on using Google Forms for assessments. It just got too old. Too many things changed. And I said, you know, I got to retire that one. You know, that was back when we had Fluberu. We still have Fluberu, but that's back when you had, had, had to have Fluberu. So I said, I better redo this one. So this is, again, a one-hour webinar on pretty much all the stuff you need to know about creating an assessment an online quiz using Google Forms, using all of the new features that are in Google Forms. And so uh, definitely take advantage of that one if that's something that you'd like. I do have a couple other quick things that I had posted. Um, I do have a blog post specifically on a neat new feature in Google Forms quizzes, speaking of Google Forms quizzes, and that is we, we now have the option for multiple correct answers when doing a short answer question. That did not used to be the case. If you were doing a Google Form quiz in the past and you asked a question like, what is the tallest mountain in the world? And if you put in the answer was Mount Everest, spelled out Mount Everest, but a student spelled it MT Everest, or they just said Everest, or they used lowercase instead of uppercase, it would have marked it as wrong because it had to be exactly that way. Um, that's not the case anymore. You can now go in, type up your question, and you can put in as many correct answers as you want. When you go to your answer key, when you click on answer key, you can put in as many correct answers and variations as you want. And then when the student takes the quiz, it will uh, compare their answers against all of the ones you said are acceptable. That is something you've been able to do in Fluberu in the past using the percent or feature. Now it's built into Google Forms quizzes. So that's good to know. Um, and then the last thing, I don't know if I had this done when we met last time, and there's still a couple of days before Halloween, so if you haven't grabbed it yet, here is my Build a Jack-O-Lantern with Google Slides activity. It's a great fun activity for kids, uh, certainly elementary, uh, probably middle school as well. It, well, anybody young at heart, let's put it that way, anybody young at heart. And what this is, is very similar to my Build a Snowman from last year, but it's a Build a Jack-O-Lantern this time around. And if you come in here and give a click on the link, it'll give it'll create a copy of the template for you. I'll let that make a copy. Basically what it does is it gives you a blank pumpkin and it gives you slides with eyes and mouths and arms and feet and hats and all kinds of stuff. And what you can do is basically come on down to your blank pumpkin. There he is. Come over here to your eyes, find a set of eyes that you like, say, oh, these are kind of cool. Copy the eyes. Come over here and paste them in and drag them onto your pumpkin. And you can start building your jack-o'-lantern with all of these really cool, you know, ha there's hats and feet and arms and mouths and all kinds of stuff. Um, and if you want to be more creative, I also include some directions in there about how you can use things like the shape tool in um, Google Slides to add shapes. If you want to make your own mouth and you say, oh, I want to use a a moon shape and then I want to turn it 90 degrees around and fill it in with yellow and make that be my mouth. You know how you can use the built-in shapes tool to go ahead and add your own shapes. Or if you want to use the polyline tool 
you can use the polyline tool to draw a shape in and connect all the different lines together and then fill that in as well. So you can make your own shapes. Um, then of course you can always insert your own images as well in Google Slides. Now when it's all done, the idea is you would then write about your jack-o'-lantern, you tell a story about them. I've seen so many cute examples either talking about your jack-o'-lantern. We had one school where they treated as a letter written by the jack-o'-lantern. So this was the jack-o'-lantern writing a letter. Others did uh, poetry. I saw jack-o'-lantern haikus. We've seen just about anything. And one school went so far as to actually animate the, the jack-o'-lanterns. The kids would make their jack-o'-lantern, then they would duplicate the slide a bunch of times. And on each new duplicate of the slide, they would move the jack-o'-lantern around a little bit. So he was dancing or doing something like that. Oh my gosh, the creativity has been amazing. It's been just absolutely so, so, so cute. Um, I will say though, it's a little bit of a tangent, but it's worth saying, probably the coolest thing that came out of all of this was I learned something from a second grader, which I think is really important that we learn from, uh, learn from um, other students. And so let me show you what I learned. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you this real quick. It'll take me just a moment to demonstrate this. Let me share this real quick with my um, personal account. And uh, it'll take me just a moment to demonstrate this for you. It's really, really clever. So hang on, I apologize for just a little bit of a delay here, but let me let me show you this. You're gonna, you're gonna appreciate it. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. So uh, on another screen here, I'm gonna open this up from my personal account. And so here's what was happening. There was a teacher who uh, was walking around the classroom looking at her second graders as they were working on their pumpkins. And she came across a pumpkin and it had her face on the pumpkin and she's like how'd you get my face on the pumpkin and the second grader said i just grabbed your picture and just dragged it on and he's like she's like well what do you mean you dragged my picture and just put, how'd you do that and here's what the kid did i didn't know you could do this okay so here i am inside of the slideshow take a look up here i just joined from my other account so here's my personal eric Kurtz account the teacher had opened up the slideshow through google classroom and was checking on the student the student saw that the teacher was in the slideshow came up grabbed her icon up here drug it down into the slideshow and let go and it copied her face into it copied that uh the uh little avatar <laughs> into the slide now it's kind of granulated or you know pixelated and you know all that it's, it's not in the highest quality but i didn't know you could do that i didn't know you could grab people's I, their avatars from up in the top when they're viewing your page and viewing your your document or slideshow guess what you can so it just goes to show it is so awesome to be able to learn from our students let them teach us and it's great when that happens because you know don't ever feel intimidated by that. If a student shows you something new, don't be like, oh yeah, I, I, I knew that. No, let them know you learned something. Show them that you have a growth mindset. Show them that you can always learn new things and, and just embrace that, you know, the whole love of learning. And so I just thought that was so cool. And I also love the fact that a second grader never thought twice about it. I never would have thought to do that. We, we get within our little confines. Second grader saw a picture, well, I can drag and drop most everything else. I bet I can drag and drop that. <laughs> so anyway, just wanted to mention that as an offshoot. What a what a what a cool thing for a student to do, first of all, but also great for us to learn. All right. Uh, so what else do we have here? I'm going to just show you a couple. Um, again, I've I've kind of put these off on a list for myself to the side of some things that I definitely wanted to draw your attention to. All right. So one of the first ones that I wanted to show you real quick um, was uh, this one called Memory Game with Google Slides. So if you follow this blog post out to the Memory Game with Google Slides, uh, what you're going to see here is a pretty clever idea on how to use Google Slides to make a memory game where, you know, you, you flip two cards and see if they match. And if they match, great. If they don't, you flip them back over and then you keep on going. Now, this teacher did it with uh, uh, graphs and equations. You know, does this equation match this graph? And um, then other people down below went in and also uh, got excited about it and they did a bunch of examples. So I'm just gonna open up an example from a teacher who, who made a version of this for little kids. This is uh, one that is um, 
Uh, she's, I don't remember what she said it was on. Well, I'll find out here in just a second uh, which one it was. Um, but here's the idea. H how are they doing this? Well, it's actually pretty clever. So the idea is what you do. Here's the actual. Here's the slide. Okay, I'm going to show you real quick what they've done. I'm going to I'm going to delete these for a second, and then I'll show you. Well, you're going to guess real quick what they did. So let me delete these real quick for a second. So what they did was they created all of these. Um, answers so like you know three times two and six or you know two times five and ten so there's the matching things they created all of this and they saved it as an image and they made that be the background that's actually the background of the slide so you can't you can't move this you can't drag it you can't move it they went in they right clicked and they said change background and they went to choose an image and they uploaded this picture and this picture is the background okay well, what they did then was they put on top of there copies of just these question mark things. Okay, so this question mark is just covering it. That's all it is. It's just a, it's just a question mark. Um, basically, it's a, an image, uh, a rectangle of a question mark. Well, the instructions for the kids are flip cards by deleting two at a time. If they match, great, keep on going. If they don't match, then undo or control Z twice to flip them back over. How cool, I mean, that's all it is. So I come here and I go, oh, let's flip this one and let's flip this one. Uh, they didn't match, so undo, undo, and try some more, you know? Oh, let's flip this one and let's flip that one. Oh, those didn't match, but, oh, I think I remembered. Wasn't that two times three up there? Undo, undo, let's see. Yep, two times three, six, yay, those matched. Now let's try some more. Now, you got to obviously work on the honor of the kids that they're not going to cheat and move things. But, you know, hey, that's that's real life, too. If you're doing this with a real memory game with cards, you can cheat on that just as easily. So it's not like it's not that it's really that different. Uh, but what a clever use of Google Slides. I love it. That's that's awesome. So anyway, I uh, wanted to show that one with you guys. I thought that was one that had really caught my attention. Um, Another fun one was um, this one on math, dice, and cards. Uh, so this one is from Dan Kaufman, I believe. And if not, I apologize, Dan, but I think this is yours. Is this yours, Dan? Yes, it's Dan Kaufman's. Um, and so what Dan did was he, it, he could, I'll have to make a copy. This is view only, so let me make a copy so I can actually edit it. Um, what he did was he made a Google Sheet with a bunch of neat math activities that deal with dice and cards and so forth. So the idea is he's got three different games, math dice, rolling dice, and playing cards. And the way it works is for math dice, what you're trying to do is make the dice equal a certain number by adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing. This is actually a game you can buy. He's got a link here to show. You can actually go out and purchase this off of like, you know, Amazon or something like that. It's just, you know, dice that you you roll and try to make them add up to a certain amount. Well, he's made a digital version. So you go to the math dice tab. You say, how many dice do you want to work with? You say, oh, we'll do three dice. Okay, if you do three dice, you only get three dice. Then you say, how many target dice are you working with? Just one is fine. And what's the minimum and the maximum numbers? You can set how high or low they can go. So in this case, I'm getting a random target number and I'm getting three numbers to work with. The job is, can you find some way to add, subtract, multiply, and divide the dice to reach the target? And of course, you can always just refresh this with your refresh button or you can um, use control R to be able to reload that if the numbers aren't working, which I guess could happen. You certainly could have a time where you maybe can't put them together and reach a certain number. I guess that could always happen, um, but that's the idea. And then he's got other ones. There's the rolling dice and the playing cards. Now for these, you do need an associated worksheet with it. So you'll notice on the directions tab under rolling dice, there's a worksheet. And for playing cards, there's a worksheet. And if you follow that, what you get is one you can make a copy of where what's going to happen is you can do these different activities. So for the really little ones, if they take the two dice that randomly rolled, they can make a two-digit number from them. Or they can add them and get the sum. Or they can subtract them and get the difference. Or they can multiply them for the product. Or they can compare them greater than, less than, equal to. And so you come here to rolling dice. And it gives you how many dice do you want and say, well, I need two dice to roll. 
and maybe my opponent needs two dice to roll, and anytime we refresh it, we get our new dice each time, and we start filling out our worksheet there. Again, I just love it. I love any time when somebody's being creative with Google tools and saying, I know it's a spreadsheet, but I bet I can turn it into a game that teaches math or gives kids opportunities to, to, to do that. So absolutely love that kind of stuff. So thanks, Dan, so much for sharing that. That is uh, greatly appreciated. Awesome. All right, let's see what we have next here. Get back over to our regular screen there. Um, Next thing I wanted to draw attention to, just heads up, uh, John Sowash from up in Michigan, good friend of mine. Uh, and a lot of folks probably know John very well. Um, he's very active in the Google community. He has a book that he put out a while back called The Chromebook Classroom. He also does a podcast related to Chromebooks in the classroom. He did a um, season of it uh, a while back. He's now back with season two. So this link will take you out to the Chromebook um, Classroom podcast. And if you uh, scroll on down, you'll see we've got two episodes from season two. Um, we've got um, one just recently on makerspaces with Chromebooks. So, uh, and you can always go back and get the original season as well of these. So I just want to thank John for continuing to uh, work on the Chromebook Classroom podcast. For those of you that use Chromebooks in your school, you can definitely pick up some good ideas from that. Appreciate it. Um, Next one I was going to draw attention to was a little bit further down. There's one called Slide Design 101. And if you follow the resource link for Slide Design 101, what you're going to find is a pretty nice uh, free professional development on not just what buttons to push when making a good Google Slideshow, but the design thoughts behind it. And so what you got are six lessons, and you can just work through these. And as you go down through, you can, um, you know, look at the different examples. There's videos to play uh, where it talks about all these different skills. But what's, what it's doing is not just teaching. It, it does teach. It does teach how do you use Google Slides? How do you insert things? How do you choose a font? How do you, uh, there's lots of other different topics that get covered here, using photographs and um, things like uh, using bullets and so forth. But it's not just how do you do it so that it turns out looking like the way it always has, but how do you do it in a creative manner? So for example, I love the approach on bullets. Instead of using bullets, don't even use bullets at all. Instead, what we see here as an example is using, a, using multiple slides. And so each slide brings in a different item, you know, or it replaces it with the first, the second, and the third one. You know, there's lots of different ways you can do this. It doesn't always have to be the exact same way we've always done bullets. Um, all together, though, I thought it was a very well put together set of lessons that is going to teach some skills, but also hopefully improve the student's understanding of graphic design and presentation skills, which that's really important. We don't want our students just to know which buttons to push. We want them to make sure, if you look at the, at, at the ISTE standards and you look at the uh, um, the communication standards in there about being a creative communicator, that they will, we want to make sure they can clearly and creatively communicate their ideas to a variety, to a variety of audiences. And so I um, thought that was great. So appreciated that being shared out. Um, next one I was going to demonstrate for you was these next two, I'm gonna put them together. We've got three strategies to organize Google Drive to meet the needs of all learners and creative organization of your drive folders and classroom folders. So these two are very similar, these next two here. And what's similar about them is they both talk about using emojis as part of your naming scheme of things. So if you didn't know you could do this, you can. So it turns out, and you may have already known this, but if not, when you create folders inside of your, your Google Drive, you are allowed to put emojis in the names of the folders, okay? And when you create files, you're allowed to put emojis in the names of your files, like, um, so if I have an example here, oh, well, I guess I don't on that page. I'll show you here in just a second. Or when you do Google Classroom, you're allowed to put emojis in the names of the topics. So here's the thing. We just need to kind of broaden our idea about emojis. A lot of times when you think of emojis, we think it's a picture. Okay, it is a picture, but it's not an image. It's actually text. An emoji is 
text. It's just like the letter A or the number two or an exclamation mark. It's just another character. It's just, it's just text, but it looks like a picture. So the idea is this. If I go to my um, Google Doc here, I'll just use this as an example. If I go to my Google Doc, and if I go up to insert special characters, I can get to all of the special characters like, you know, foreign language characters or the pie symbol or something like that. But I can also come here on insert special characters and I can choose instead of symbol, I can choose emoji and I can find people and animals and just all kinds of things. So if I find an emoji that I like, I can go ahead and click on that emoji and I can add it into my Google document. And it's just like a letter. It's just like another character, it's like the letter A. I can highlight it and I can change the font size and make it really big or make it small or make it whatever. It's just like a letter. It's not a, it's not a picture. I can't stretch it and drag it and make it bigger. I have to change the font size because it's like a letter. Well, here's the point, guys. I can do that same thing and like copy that emoji. And I can do this for the names of my files, the names of my folders, the topics in classroom, take a look at the name of our file today. And somebody just did. Good job, guys. If I go up and rename our file today, I can go ahead and paste in the chicken. So our document today is pumpkin googly eyes chicken spark Google user group. So, you know, that's, so you, we can do that. You can put those in the names of folders and files and topics. Why is that helpful? Well, visuals can be great cues for kids. Think about being able to find that folder quicker because it's got the icon that looks like the topic, you know? So for, you know, in this case, um, I used a, uh, a pumpkin because it was, you know, October, you know, so that fit. But if it was a folder for science stuff, we could have a microscope emoji, you know, or if it was for language arts or you could have a pencil or for social studies, a globe. Um, same thing for your topics. And it can be your folders, it can be your files, but what a great way to be able to uh, bring a little bit more um, distinction to those for students to be able to find their stuff faster. Hey, and us as well. Who doesn't like emojis? So there you go. All right, a couple more and we'll be wrapping up. So what else did I want to mention real quick? Uh, next one, green screen image editing with Google Drawings. Now this one I love. I've got to try this. I'm going to, so uh, on my to-do list, I'm going to do this for a, a training sometime, do this as a conference activity. This is going to be a blast. So here's the idea um, of this one. What you do, this is by Larissa. Thank you, Larissa, for posting this. Um, what you do is you take a picture of yourself or your kids or whatever, and then you use some kind of image editing tool. She is suggesting Lunapic, for example, which is web-based and it runs on Chromebooks. There's other tools, and she mentioned those as well, but Lunapic is a good one. And you take a picture of yourself or your kids. And if you pull it into Lunapic, Lunapic can be used to remove the background. And so if you go into Lunapic, if you've ever done anything with image editing, you'll know just what I mean. Basically, you can go in, open the image, and tell it to um, remove, to make transparent uh, anything that you click on up to a tolerance. And so you can go in and you can basically erase the background so that when it's all done, it's, you're left with a cutout of yourself, okay, or the kids or whatever. The idea then is, once you have all these cutouts, you can now go into Google Drawings and the students could, for example, grab an image of a historical place or somewhere in the world or, you know, something that deals with the science concept you're studying. And they can then drag and drop themselves into it. And because you've run this through Lunapic or something like that ahead of time, they're transparent around them. It looks like they're actually in the image. And then they can add speech bubbles as if they're talking and they can put themselves into these different environments. And Google Drawings will let you have these images off to the side of them and they can just draw them, on, drag them onto the canvas when they need to use them. I love it. That is so much fun. So I definitely want to try that one out sometime in the future. Um, next up, because it is just so cool. Let's see, what do we have? Oh, a couple of extensions, Whisper and Checkmark. Now, Whisper, these are both from EdTech team, so heads up on that. Um, they're putting out some really awesome things here recently. Whisper is an extension that lets you send a quick message to your class or to individual students 
through Google Classroom without being very disruptive. So here's the idea. Here's a link to it. If you want to install it, you can head on out there. It's a Chrome web extension called Whisper. You can get that installed. The idea is I've got it installed right now. If I come up here, it's in the top right. I can click on my little Whisper extension. What it does is it brings in all of your Google classes. So it loads in every class you teach. And if I wanted to send a quick message to my students, all I would have to do is come in here and pick the class that I want to send the message to. Okay. And when I select that class, I could now type in the message and hit send. And what it's going to do is it's going to pop up as long as they have the Whisper extension too. So you install the extension and you have it pushed out to the kids as well. It'll just pop up a very simple little box in the bottom of their screen with your message or your link to the website you want them to go visit. And it doesn't interrupt things, it just pops up in the bottom corner there out of the way. I can also say, well, I don't want to send it to everybody. So instead of clicking on the class, I can click on the little icon of a person next to the name of the class. And if I do that, well, that class only has one. Let me pick one with more. Um, let's do that one. Now, if I pick this one, I can see all of the kids in the class and I can choose just one student and send them a message. And so just this little pop-up will show up on the bottom of their screen with my message or link or whatever I want to send to them. And that's a great way to be able to quickly communicate with your student. If you don't want to disrupt the class, you just need to send them an, a quick note or give them some information. Now, at the same time, the other thing that they put out extension-wise was one that got a ton of interest this month. Oh my gosh, I've seen so many people tweeting about this. This it's called Checkmark, the Checkmark extension. Now, I think I've got it turned on. If not, let me turn it back on. No, I turned it back off here. Let me turn it back on. Okay, I probably have to refresh my document now that I turned it off and back on. But no problem. I'll refresh real quick. So here's what the Checkmark extension does. So what it does is it allows you to leave feedback for your students very quickly. Now we all know. There's loads of ways to leave feedback in Google Docs. So if I were to come down here and say, oh, I want to leave feedback for my student. This, Let's say this is their essay or whatever. We all know I can highlight the text from the student. And we all know I can click the add comment button and I can type in comments for them. We all know we can do that. There's loads of other ways to leave feedback. I actually did an entire webinar on that called fantastic feedback tools for Google Docs. We talk about ways to leave video feedback, how to record your voice and leave feedback, how to do handwritten feedback, all kinds of stuff. Well, here's just one more option. If you have the checkmark extension installed, what you can do is highlight whatever you need to highlight for the student, okay? And if you, oh, I'm gonna do it wrong here, highlight whatever you need for the student. If I come up and click on the extension, I had to turn it on, forgot to turn it on. That was my fault. I did not have it turned on. Now I've got it turned on. If I come in and highlight anything now, when I do that, what I'm going to get, oh, it's putting it up at the top here. There it is. Sorry, I'm, I'm doing this poorly. I'm not showing you a very good example of this. Forgot to turn it on. And <laughs> now that I've turned it on, let's go ahead and try it again. So uh, now that I've got it turned on, if I come in here and I highlight some text, once I've got the text highlighted, it will give me, oh, nope, hang on a second. I'm losing my screen here. Try that again, Eric. Once I get it highlighted, it gives me this pop-up up here of common comments we may want to give to kids. And it includes check your capitalization, um, check for fragment, check for punctuation, check for subject verb agreement. So all I do is highlight the kid's text, click on the abbreviation, and boom, it adds subject verb agreement. And so I don't have to even type it in. I just highlight what I want and I go, watch your spacing. Now I can still click on it and leave more feedback. I can even go in and edit it if I want to change it a little bit. But what I can do is so quickly highlight some text and just simply click on the little floating toolbar there and add that feedback in. And then I can go back up to check mark, click it again to turn it off if I don't want it to be constantly up there. And then I probably will have to refresh my document again. Otherwise, extensions usually hang around. If you don't uh, refresh your document, they tend to keep doing what they were doing, whatever that might have been. So uh, whisper and check mark two from EdTech team. And we really appreciate uh, them sharing those extensions out here this month. All right.
Um, last few things. We are at the end here, but I just wanted to mention um, wiggly letters. I skipped over that. Everybody loves wiggly letters. Okay, so what's that about? Here's a really cool one called Wiggly Letters for Docs, Slides, and Drawings. Uh, this one is just, it's just fun. It's cute. So basically what happens here is, um, let me go ahead and make a copy of this so you can see what it looks like. And I'll make a copy of it. That's the view only version of it. So what happens here is Nicole has created this awesome template that you can make a copy of where she has made animated GIFs of every letter of the alphabet. And so if you come in here and you click on any of these, here's A, B, C, D, and so forth. Every letter of the alphabet and a few punctuation marks, she has made animated GIFs of them wiggling. And all you have to do is basically go in and copy and paste. So you come here and you go, oh, I want to use this cute wiggly letter. So I'm going to copy uh, the A. We'll come over to our Google document here and I will paste that in. And there's my wiggly letter in my Google Doc. <laughs> it's just an animated GIF, but um, you can use this in, you know, drawings and slides and docs. And if you're looking for a way to just kind of punch up things, especially for the little ones, that could be really cute to throw in some wiggly letters. So I appreciated her sharing that out. Um, and the last thing I'm going to stop on this one is the one that I just saw yesterday, but it is so creative. I thought I've got to share this with folks. So it's the very last one here, create your own My School app in Google Slides for mobile devices. So what is this about? Okay, you got to take a look at this one. So in this one, what Micah did was he said, you know, a lot of schools have like a mobile app and you download the mobile app and you can push out stuff to the mobile app. That's fantastic. Love it, love it, love it. But what if you can't afford one or you don't have the tech skills to do it yourself or there's some other reason that just, oh, we don't want the branding on it or whatever it is. He said, here's a creative idea. I love this. Basically what he did was he said, what if you make a Google slideshow and you format it, portrait like this, and you put hyperlinks on it to jump from you know, page from slide to slide in the Google slideshow. Now, let me go ahead and open up an example here. Um, <laughs> here's this template. I'll make a copy of this. Oh, I probably should have opened it up in a new tab. It'll probably yell at me here. Let me try that again. Open that up in a new tab. Um, I think this is his, I think this is his uh, sample. There we go. And so, um, Here's like the the uh, the template we can work from. And so he's got a Google slideshow and he went in and he changed it to portrait, which again, you can do that. Slides don't have to be horizontal. You can go file, page setup, and you can make it be vertical instead of horizontal, like landscape or portrait instead of landscape. And then he's got like, you know, click here to enter. And he's got breakfast and lunch, homework, class notes, school calendar. And each one of these are linked to a different slide. So breakfast and lunch, is linked to the breakfast and lunch slide and homework is linked to the homework slide and he can go in and he can update what the homework is and class notes is linked to class notes in linking this is something we've done forever it's you basically you click on something and you click on the link button up in the top toolbar oh i've already got a link but there it is you click on the link button and you can insert a link and when you go to insert a link you can tell it that you want it to jump to a certain page or go out to a web address in this case he's having it jump to a different slide so what's the point of all of this? Well, if you do that, if you build this slides version of a mobile app, you can then publish it to the web and then people can go to their uh, mobile device, open up the link you give them, and depending upon the device they're on, if they're on an iOS device, they can open up the link and then they can click to um, they can click add to home screen. If you're on an Android device, you can open it up, click the three dots and choose add to home screen. And you'll get a shortcut to that live slideshow on the home screen of your phone. Now, what's going to happen every time you click it? You click it, it's going to launch the live version of the slideshow that is designed to look like a mobile app. And it's if you click it, it's going to jump you to the different pages. 
And you, of course, can update this in the background. You can put new homework in. You can put new breakfast and lunch stuff in. You can put new stuff in. And so you're basically running an interactive slideshow that's mimicking a mobile app. I thought, oh my gosh, that is just so cool. What a, what a creative way to do that. Uh, so anyway, um, that's all of the things I for sure, for sure, for sure wanted to mention. I do encourage you though, please look at all of the other uh, links that are here. There are so many great ones. So as I'm looking at our feedback, we did have one person ask if you can customize the feedback text and check mark. Um, no, not yet. This is a brand new extension, but I am pretty sure that I read they said that was coming, that that is in the plan, that uh, EdTech team is going to add more functionality to it. So you'd be able to have a customized, customized feedback as well. At the moment, it's just what they've got built into it. But hey, great start. We really appreciate that. All right, now I'm going to scroll back up through the document and see if there's anything glaring that I missed here. Um, how do you get the embedded calendar in Google Sites to look like the new calendar? Well, you can't make that happen yet. I think we're just going to have to wait for Google to do that for us. It's probably going to be part of the conversion from the old to the new. At the moment, even if you're using new, gal new Google Calendar, when you embed it in a website, it still looks like the old version. So we'll just have to wait and hope that that's something that as the new version becomes official and the old version goes away, that maybe that will also start looking different should look different for people viewing it as an embedded calendar. Right now, though, there's not an option. I, I've tried it. Yeah, I put it in and went, and it looks like the old version when it gets embedded. So I am not aware of any way to get around that just yet. Sounds like something we need Google to um, take care of in all the updates. All right, guys. Well, it looks like we're good. I don't see any more big questions at the moment. So as we wrap up, my final things I want to remind you guys of is if you joined a little bit late, please don't forget under the important links, there is a spot to sign in. We have a sign in form that allows us to keep attendance of who, who joined us today. It allows me to send you a certificate of attendance and it allows me to report how many people attended to Google. I, I let them know the numbers, not names or anything like that but I do give the numbers of those who attended. So I would encourage you to please fill out that attendance form if you did not get a chance to do that earlier. Other than that, I would remind you to please stay plugged into our website, which is at bit.ly slash GEGOhio. I will get an official web address for it shortly, but for now, hey, that's fine. We'll just go with the, uh, the bit.ly address for now. But if you go to bit.ly slash GEGOhio, that'll take you to the homepage there. And from there, we have a link to the, to the discussion board, which is our um, Google community forum. But we also have a link to our monthly meetings. And um, if you follow that link and scroll on down, you will see our current plan for when those are. They do change from time to time, so please do check back. Uh, at the moment, November 30th is the scheduled meeting for November. It could change. Things can change from time to time, so do check back here. But um, once we do have that, um, the agenda and the video link will be put in here as well. So you can always find those. You can get previous uh, meetings as well um, up here, the ones we've just had, and then as well as some from way back. So you can go as far back as you want if you want to get to some of the uh, earlier meetings. Uh, other than that, I want to thank you guys so very much for taking time out of your day to uh, be here with us. Um, please do stay plugged into uh, the uh, different resources we put out through Spark that I put out through my controlaltachieve.org or <laughs> .com, controlaltachieve.com website and that we put out through our GEG Ohio site. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. My contact info is under the welcome and introductions section. And in the future, if you'd like to be in the Hangout um, and actually talk and share some things, just drop me an email. Just let me know and I'll be happy to send you an invite to jump in the Hangout. Uh, otherwise, please continue to participate through the chat options and in the document as well. We just definitely appreciate everybody sharing and being here today. So thanks so much. Take care, and we will see you next time.